I can have my cup of tea, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, everyone. My name is Kajal and welcome to my channel. This space is about career opportunities, career growth and interviews with amazing people all to help you be the best you can be. If you're new here, consider subscribing. Also press the bell button so you're notified every time I come up with a new video. In today's video, I'm interviewing Valeria. At the time of this interview, she was pursuing her PhD from UCSD in Earth Science. If you're wondering what's Earth Science, I have the same question. So that is what I asked her and also what led her to pursue a PhD in Earth Science. In this video, we also spoke about the common challenges faced by students pursuing PhD and what helped her and hopefully it can help you too. I will add timings for each of these topics so you can jump ahead if you want to. And that's about it. Let's get started. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to my channel. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. So tell us about you. Okay, so my name is Valeria and I'm from Mexico. I have been here in San Diego for the last four years. Nice. And I came here because I was studying my master's and I had the opportunity to come here for an internship. And I really liked it and I decided to stay here for my PhD. So you said you are into earth science. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about what is earth science? I'm into something that is called marine electromagnetic methods. Marine electromagnetic it methods. It sounds very fancy, but well, like, it's kind of fancy. The, 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 <laughs> it is the, fancy. The, the, it is fancy. <laughs> It is fancy, but it's not as complicated as one would think. But we basically, we go out in the sea and then we deploy instruments in the middle of the ocean and we, we leave them there for months and maybe a year and then we come back, we collect them and then we play with the data that we were measuring for all that time. And the data that we collect is electromagnetic fields. So okay. it's basically the electro electric and magnetic fields that are happening because this is going to get very technical, but I might, I'll try to make it simple. So you have waves that are coming from outer space. Let's say that you have solar variation that is coming. So these charged particles are coming through the uh, space and then they reach the atmosphere. And once they reach the atmosphere, Imagine that the Earth is kind of a balloon and then if someone is hitting the balloon, the balloon is going to be wobbling and responding to that, okay? So when you hit the balloon, the Earth is going to respond in a certain way and that's what we're measuring. How is the Earth responding to this energy, to these waves that are coming constantly towards it? And once we can understand how the Earth is responding, we can see what is the Earth like? So there are waves coming from the space yeah. and they are impacting our Earth's ocean and you are using your instruments, fancy instruments, yeah, fancy. to study those. Yeah. And it will eventually help us figure out minerals and chemicals and where we can get all these resources. Maybe. Yes, yes. Mainly is that, but also you can get a picture of how the Earth looks like on okay. the, the deep interior of the earth. Yeah. Uh, my next question to you is going to be, so can you walk us through your educational or career trajectory mm -hmm. that led you to here? How did you go through it all? Yeah, sure. I had sort of the bias that my father is a physicist. Oh. And when I was a little kid, I was always exposed to this other version of seeing things because we used to do a lot of road trips and then when we were in the road I was staring at all these different things and you know natural phenomenons that amazed me and my dad as a physicist of course I was a curious kid and I was always asking him like oh what is why is this happening how come we have all these different things and blah 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 and he was always telling me that the explanations easy enough for me to understand and this sort of fed, this fed my curiosity, of course. And later on, when I started my my undergrad degree, I was more inclined towards math because I had a sort of bad experience in physics because I was going to compete in a in a sort of a state competition and I was very stressed out. And I was like, this is not what I want. When I did my undergrad, I started doing I started the math program, but then I realized like, oh, this is all abstract and this is 
I don't see the, 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 you know, how this applies into the way that physical movement is happening or anything else. It's just... So your curious bug was coming back. And then my curious... How is this applied? <laughs> yes, I was like, oh, what, what is the application of all these different things and the math and the equations? So I was like, okay, after six months, I was, I was, I decided to transfer back to physics. After that, I, I, I had to decide why, what I was going to do next. And, I, and of course, if you're in a physicist degree, you basically need to specialize in something because physics involves everything. Most, and then I decided to go for earth sciences because I knew that I loved earth. And I, I also went to Chile when I was in, in my undergrad, I went to Chile. And in Chile, they do a lot of earth sciences because they have tons of minerals and they spend a lot of budget on, on, on these areas of expertise. And I was, all, I was thrilled about it. I was excited about it. And I, then I decided to do earth sciences for my master's degree. Okay. And then when I was in my master's degree, <laughs> <laughs> I heard about this project that was going to take place in the Gulf of California. And I was interested, of course. Then I asked the researcher that if I could be part of the project. And he said, yes, of course you can come. And I didn't know what to do for my, for my thesis at that point. And when I had this opportunity, I was like, mm, maybe I can just use the data that we collect from there and use it for my thesis. And then we went into, into the expedition and then I met Skiff Constable, who is my current advisor. He's one of the, he's world leader expert in this field. Then I decided to ask him, okay, can I do my, can I do an internship with you in, in, in San Diego? It was so close by. I was like, I'm not going to let this opportunity go away from my hands. I'm just going to ask go. him. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to ask him. And he says, yes, of course you can come. And I was like, yes, I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, and then I came and also another friend of mine came. And actually in this time of the year, I decided I love it here so much. I'm going to apply for the PhD. Wow. And I did it. I prepared for a month. I studied for the GRE, the TOEFL, everything that I needed to do in order to apply for the PhD. Okay. I, this was, I, yes, this was in December. And then when I was back in Mexico, maybe a couple of months later, I found out that I was accepted. And sometimes when you're doing a PhD, you are going to struggle mentally more than anything because you're expected to do great things and you ask yourself, what are those great things that I have to do? And I have no idea. I don't even know what I'm doing. And if you ask around, lots of lots and lots of different students are in the same page. So if you are considering or doing a PhD, you have to know that the PhD is not only that you're going to become an ex expert in a specific area, but you have to know that you're gonna di you're gonna go deeper into yourself because you will know. You will have to accept the level that you're at in order to move forward. You just have to you have to have the passion and you have to have a motivation in the back always to remind you why am I doing this for? Am I doing this for others? Am I doing this for myself? What do I want to get out of this PhD? In my case. I know that the PhD gives me a ton of flexibility and it gives me a ton of useful experiences such as going into research cruises, being exposed to nature and to talk to others. Getting support from others is super important. Don't isolate yourself. This is very, very, very important because the PhD can be very isolating. And if you don't ask for help, you can just go crazy in your own world because if you don't know how to do something that maybe it's very simple that you are struggling with, go to the next person and ask them, hey, do you have any idea how to do this? Because I have no idea and I've been putting this energy in all this time. And maybe they all, they've done it and, and then you can do it much easier. And I'm doing that. <laughs> I'm just taking advantage of it. But help. Just ask for help. Talk to your advisor. Your advisor is super, super important. And I have been very clear to him. He's very supportive. And I'm very, very grateful for having him as my, as, as my advisor. So who are your support system? You mentioned your advisor. Mm -hmm. Who else were the people that 
helped you or you know you were the people who you could go up to and ask hey i don't know how to do this okay most of them are either students in the same lab postdocs that are working with the, my advisor or another advisor that i know that their area of expertise is similar or something that i i know that maybe they know how to do it and i have no idea and also um, other professors you can talk to other professors that you there's i hear in that at scripts you have the amandus um, no, i don't know how to say it but it's just a couple of researchers that their work is to besides doing the research they are they're meant to help students to figure out if they have any problems and and i feel more comfortable talking to them and also to other students here so try try building up a space where you feel comfortable enough to exp express your doubts. And also something, something very important. You have to write a lot when you're in the PhD. If you have to write a proposal, if you have to write a paper, if you have to write your thesis. When you're writing something, just write whatever comes that, to mind. Just put it all out. Everything. Don't even go back and read it. Just put everything. And I've heard this advice so many times and I was like, oh, how do I do this? I don't know how to do this. But just write and then don't even look back. Just even if you have an idea, oh, I want to write something about this. Just write that. I want to write something about this. And then go back to it later, maybe another day. And then you'll read it and then it'll be like, oh, okay, maybe I can add this other information. And then... And then con just keep up writing. Do half an hour intervals. I, that's what I do. I do half an hour inter interval and then I do something else. And then I come back to it and then I do another half an hour. And then okay. I do something else. Because if you're saturating your brain, you're going to start to stress about this situation. Just train your brain to be more comfortable with reading a paper that maybe you will not be familiar with, but then you're at the same time you are getting in your subconscious these patterns on how they write, how do how do they present their their are they are their ideas, and you just get that in the back of your head. And the next time you have to write something, it'll come natural. It will come easier. You won't be ah oh, like struggling and trying to push harder and and and, and questioning yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we are running out of time, but I still have one more question okay. to ask you. I know we gave out a lot of advice and we spoke about a lot of challenges. What are the things that really helped you? The little things that, you know, either sparked up your day or made you more efficient. Okay. Or the things I have that one. change. Okay. The one thing. Let's go for it. I have one. <laughs> Everybody talks about this, but I, it seriously works and it's very... It's, it's trendy. You'll see a lot of this in social media and blah, blah, blah. Okay. It's meditation. Meditation is one of the most powerful things that I have ever done in my life. I do it every day. Mm -hmm. Right after I wake up, I go to the bathroom, I clean my face, brush my teeth or my tongue, because it's very important to clean your tongue, <laughs> remove all the toxins that build up in, during the night. After that, I go in my pajamas, I put my mat, you can put a pillow, whatever, and I meditate in silence for 15 minutes. It's easy to say to meditate, but, but it's difficult. It's you have difficult. to build it up. You have to build up the 15 to, minutes. It takes time. You have to build it up, but ever since I started the meditation, I feel so connected with myself and I can act because I know what's in my head and I know that whatever I have in my head doesn't define me sometimes we think that oh if if I think this how oh, this is this is my this is part of me but it's not true the head the mind and the, the thoughts that you have in the back of your head are trying to protect you and sometimes the way that it tries to protect you is by creating these unrational is in areas or non-realistic situations that will never happen let's say that you're worried about this project oh my gosh i have to submit this and i haven't and i have to and if you let your mind take control of that it will drive you crazy try meditation 
it helped her it helped me it might help you or not then we will find something else but try meditation first yeah you can try writing in a journal i can't I, it doesn't go with me that but i sometimes do it just when i feel like you can take a walk you can dance a little bit or <laughs> anything that brings you to the present moment that's going to help you all right uh, thank you so much for doing this thank I you for really having appreciate me appreciate I know that I talk a lot. <laughs>